Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci. Tonight's speaker has extensive experience of observing and modeling the oceans and climate. In current projects and collaborations, he applies knowledge of the ocean state, e.g. temperature, ocean currents, and surface weather addressing environmental challenges. In previous work, he has studied the drift of turtle hatchlings in their early life stages, the drift and melting of icebergs that are from Greenland and Antarctica, and the fate of buoyant pumice that periodically appears at the ocean surface after submarine volcanic eruptions. Most recently, he developed ways to forecast the seasonal drift of sargassum seaweed that is now found extensively across the tropical Atlantic. This work is designed to inform decision makers and local communities who have been recently challenged by extensive beaching of sargassum at coastlines around the Caribbean and West Africa, a likely consequence of climate change. Please welcome Professor Robert Marsh. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it's nice to see such a, a large audience. And so um, I, I'm going to tell you a, a story about how the ocean moves um, by moving moving everything else with it and how that really uh, has such a lot of impact around the world so it's a bit of a, a tour uh, starting at home and then traveling to some faraway places and giving you a few uh, flavors of some of the work that i've been involved with uh, over the last few years so um, I've called my talk uh, the mobile ocean. Uh, it's moving all the time and why it matters. I'm from the University of Southampton, of course, which is the only time you'll see my creation there. So um, already you can see uh, a little animation. So I use occasionally animations. If you can pick out what you can see there, you'll probably recognize the geography. Most of us are from not far from here. Um, the uh, Southampton water and the Solent. Um, what you see there, are little moving uh, red dots which are being taken on a sort of looping 14 day journey away from town key in southampton and this is a kind of hypothetical simulation of what happens when something drops into the uh, top of southampton water the idea is to illustrate that the um the movements of the the, the objects in this case, you can imagine that might be plastic, is backwards and forwards twice a day because we have what we call semi diurnal tides, so twice a day tides, and so they kind of go backwards and forwards. But there's also a gradual movement out towards the Solent. But sometimes they change color, they become this kind of pink color when they get stranded. Uh, and this is developing the idea that material can, can both move with water, but it, it can also get stuck on the seabed or at the coast. If you watch this enough times over, you'll realize that a minority of the little drifting red dots make it out to the kind of eastern Solent. So they're just roughly around the sort of south of Portsmouth after 14 days. So this is the beginning of a much longer journey. And the next uh, animation, a completely different animation, but rather sort of simple, just to sort of give you an idea, of what could happen next. So we start from that little circle in the English channel there. So we've assumed that these bits of material, maybe plastic, have made it into the um, Solent and then on into the channel. And then this goes for much longer than two weeks. This goes for five years altogether. It takes a while for it to play out. I'll probably talk uh, enough for it to play twice. And if you look carefully, you'll see that a um, few of these little blobs um, there's only a few of them just to illustrate what can happen and the time it takes. And that has only run once. So perhaps I can run that twice. How can I do that? I don't think I can run it again. Well, if you remember what I what I showed you, I'm going to end the show. Um, what we saw was that um, a couple of them made it into the Arctic. And so that's just reinforcing the idea of what goes into the ocean at the coast will eventually uh, end up far away and if we live uh, in this part of the world what we tuck away into the into the solent is highly likely uh, to if it ends up anywhere to end up in the arctic so i seem to not be able to progress the slides maybe i can 
what happens when you okay so now i get the movie again i'll probably let them run through so what they're doing is that they're working across the southern north sea you go into the skagrak which is that gap between denmark and sweden and norway and then they join what's called the norwegian coastal current and so there's always where we look in the ocean some general movement of water in a particular direction when they round the top of norway for a few more years they squeeze their way through that little gap in the islands of I think Yan Mayan and um, Russia and into what's called the Barents Sea, which is really part of the Arctic. And that's probably the reason why the Arctic is becoming gradually contaminated with plastic, which is coming from far to the south. Not too many people living up in the Arctic, but there's, there's plenty of ways for the kind of pollution from lower latitudes to end up that far north. But it takes only five years to get from the English Channel to the Arctic drifting slowly. Okay, thank you. So that's just a sort of a foretaste of um, the kind of thing that I do. So um, I typically use a range of uh, measurements and computers to understand ocean currents. And over the lockdown, the pandemic years, um, just going into that and all the way through it, I was working on a book um, called Ocean Currents, which uh, here I show you the um, front page, or the cover, I should say. And I wrote this book with a Dutch colleague, Eric uh, Van Seville. Um, uh, we are at the bottom there. And we published this book um, in summer 2021, finally kind of uh, was available. And it was really written for students who are um, working uh, to understand the ocean. So it's based on uh, many years of uh, experience of teaching students about ocean currents and how they're changing our world. So we had the subtitle there, Physical Fibers in a Changing World. And uh, writing a book is obviously a fairly daunting prospect, um, even after years of working in university um, and writing lots of research papers. I, I didn't quite know how to do this. Um, but I, really, I really wanted to um, have a go at writing this, this kind of book and so we asked uh, these questions and so we, we wrote the, the book as a, a series of chapters that were sort of uh, addressing these kind of big questions we think people care about so you know, a big question which has been around for a few years now is what ends up what happens to our plastic where does it end up and in fact why does it end up in faraway places um, particularly in the oceans uh, the second question, I'll just run through them quickly, is, is kind of why, why should um, marine creatures be affected or how might they be affected by ocean currents? It turns out that they are strongly influenced by, by currents. Just as if you're a bird watcher, you'll be familiar with the, um, the sort of phenomenon of rare birds arriving when there's been an unusual uh, easterly or westerly wind. And so you'll get these kind of uh, arrivals from Far away places that don't usually show up in places like the Scillies or on the east coast of the, of the UK. In the same way, um, marine creatures are very affected by ocean currents. And um, another question there is really relates more to our nearby um, UK experience. So, the UK, uh, British Isles, I should say, uh, sits on a really shallow uh, shelf sea. If you go further to the west and you kind of drop off shelf break uh, into the deep ocean so we don't really live by the ocean we live by uh, by the sea and at that place where it gets suddenly a lot deeper we have a very strong flow which is really quite important for lots of reasons uh, which i won't go into but um that was that question and then we know probably from watching the news just how dramatic the weather can be in the tropics um we have lots of sometimes dramatic flooding and kind of quite extreme weather, monsoons and what have you. So that's also very affected by how the ocean moves around down in the tropics. So we get more into, into the sort of scientific um, kind of uh, language here. It's about how the Atlantic changes the waters and how that affects our climate. Um, also, if we look down to the south to around Antarctica, what's going on there? is an intimate, um, basically uh, a, a sort of 
coupling, if you like, of, of the ocean and the ice sheets of Antarctica. And when people worry about uh, major changes in the Antarctic ice sheet, um, it's because of this uh, interaction with ocean currents. And we all know about great rivers. It's probably one of the things that really got me first interested in the environment was the idea that a tiny little stream in the mountains can one day and much further away become a, uh, a mighty river that, that flows out to sea. And in, in those cases where the rivers are really uh, large and, and just, you know, conveying huge amounts of, of water, that, that has great effect um, in, in the oceans as well. The oceans are sometimes thought of as individual sort of separate places like the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian, but they're really connected together. And when we look at the oceans as a, as a collection, they're really just one big ocean. And so we wanted to talk about that as well. Um, and finally, there's this sort of fundamental um, important role that the ocean plays in our climate system. So the Earth is is uh, is governed by uh, well, the Earth's climate, I should say, is is really dependent on what happens between the ocean and the atmosphere. A little bit to do with the land and the ice, but it's the ocean and the atmosphere that that really determine our climate and also the rate at which our climate is changing. And so we covered these different themes, and that's probably the serious. So to some extent, serious part of um, my talk is just to sort of go over what we thought about. And, and there's some pictures here just to summarize each of those chapters. So I won't explain in detail, but the top left is, is showing where we think plastic's going. Um, the top middle is showing how turtle hatchlings get swept around. The top right shows how water runs past um, the western north north of the British Isles, along the break of the shelf. Uh, then this middle panel shows us changes in tropical climate, things going on in the North Atlantic, which are matter for our weather. So a little bit of um, Antarctic ice, and the bottom row runs from left to right, showing us the great rivers of um, South Asia during the monsoon. Then we see a picture in the middle uh, of bottom row which shows how the uh, Indian and the Atlantic Oceans connect south of Africa and finally uh, uh, a sort of schematic of how the Atlantic Ocean uh, is maintaining our climate. But I think that um, a lot of what we do is um, has told us a story about where we sort of come from and how our thinking has developed over the years. So if we go back um, <clears throat> a few years, um, this is more of a um, retrospective on what people used to think about the ocean currents. <clears throat> I think that um, in, in the old atlases and books that I looked at when I was young, um, the ocean was kind of summarized in this rather sort of elegant way as a sort of nice organized pattern of swirls. And the currents are named and they're, they're kind of given a sort of uh, a kind of a permanent status as, as following these lines. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see there are arrows pointing from southwest to northeast across the Atlantic, and that corresponds to what we call the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Current. And all over the other parts of the ocean, you see that there are broad sweeping flows. And this looks like a very well organized pattern, but the reality is very different. And this next picture is a bit complicated but I'll explain it best I can by telling you that um, what we do as oceanographers is that we, we go off and cross the ocean and we have the opportunity to do interesting things um, to understand how the ocean works. And something rather simple but subtle that was done on this passage from New Zealand to Antarctica was the periodic deployment, so throwing over the side of the ship, of two um, boys that could report their position to satellite for regular intervals afterwards. Now the subtle point is that there are different uh, colored squares and colored what we call trajectories uh, that, that are telling you like a piece of spaghetti where the boys went. And they've traveled quite a long way over a period here of I think a month. Um, and 
although they started side by side because they were put over the ship at the same time in almost exactly the same place, they were just slightly in a different place. And what that means is that over time they kind of separated, they drifted apart. If you remember the film Castaway when Tom Hanks loses his favourite volleyball, um, it drifts away from his raft because it's doing something different. So what's the volleyball called? Um, Wilson. So Tom Hanks stays on the raft and Wilson drifts away. And it's the same principle. Um, things never stay together in the ocean. They always get mixed apart. And that, that is really consequential for understanding how the ocean works. It's, it's very messy. And the next slide is just a collection of all of the many um, pieces of um, drift data that have been assembled over about 40 years. My colleague Eric uh, put this together to show how messy the ocean is. So while we think about ocean currents as being rivers in the sea steadily moving across the Atlantic, when we look really closely at the ocean, we see that it's it's basically spaghetti. So nothing is ever going to follow the same route. There are some general common pathways through the ocean. That's how people get sort of, you know, if, you, if you're um, shipwrecked, so to speak, and you're, you're in two or three lifeboats, it's very hard to stay together. So over a period of just days to weeks, you'll end up in very different places drifting apart. Now, um, mentioning the sort of beginnings of all this, um, I'm just going to go very quickly through the sort of history of things. We haven't been able to measure ocean currents for very long. So it all started scientifically about 200 years ago when this chap called uh, James Rannell, um, working for, for the Navy, uh, was beginning to do some meticulous work, as people often did in the old days, um, measuring how ships drifted um, in, in the entire Atlantic, and that's a map of the Atlantic, and it's hard to see detail, but he was able to put together um, a, a good sort of first guess about how the currents looked in the Atlantic. As I mentioned before, and I should have shown this perhaps already, um, we have modern ways of following ocean currents, and that's my colleague Eric who helped me write the book. Um, so Eric is deploying this, um, this boy, uh, over the side of a research ship. Um, and you can see that it's, it's a fairly simple piece of apparatus. It basically has a, a float that keeps it um, obviously from sinking and then a tethered cable down to this kind of um, big pulley socket it's called, it's broke it. And that means that it's gonna move with the current at the depth that that drogue is deployed, which is 15 to 50 meters. And because of modern technology, it can report its position to satellites um, quite frequently. And that's how we obtained all the information. So we've gone a long way in 200 years from trying to estimate how ships drift in the ocean to get a first idea about ocean currents through various other technologies, including this more recent way of filling the ocean up with drifting objects, which will tell us where things are moving. Now, the next slide is a little bit um, formal, but it, it summarizes how oceanography and that includes measuring ocean currents has evolved since about 1950. And there's a bit going on here, but I'll just explain that uh, in, the, in the green I talk about, uh, or I indicate the time that we um, saw the invention and the first use of various techniques for measuring ocean currents, different kinds of floats and current meters, things called bottom pressure recorders and acoustic coupling current profiles, some more modern technology. So in the 1980s, my first taste of research was trying to understand how people use acoustic methods to measure ocean currents, which is now pretty standard, but that's only been around for 40 years. And since about, um, well, since the end of the 90s and the year 2000, the global community of ocean scientists has been able to much more uh, reliably measure the ocean using what are called Argo flakes. I haven't got time to go into all those details, but at the same time, um, that the international community of ocean scientists has periodically come together to organise these uh, very expensive campaigns to cooperate and go and observe the oceans. And that's given us a lot of insight. So those um, acronyms running from 
ITY through to ghost ship, including WOS. Um, that was the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, which is the reason I came to Southampton in 1991, actually. So the UK government and other governments committed a considerable amount of funding to support um, the UK scientists who uh, were concerned with ocean oceanography. So, and then at the bottom, various ongoing the arrows point into the future because as climate change has become uh, more of a, a sort of recognized issue, there's been more of a determination to uh, develop programs and technologies, including satellites and uh, other programs that, that sustain our observations of the environment. So the reason why we know as much as we know about the warming of the earth and changing of our climate is because we're able to sustain these really expensive programs even though you know economic times are difficult we are finding cheaper and cheaper ways of measuring the ocean the final thing i want to point out is is this kind of growing sort of um triangle this long skinny triangle at the top which is called numerical models so that's basically using powerful computers to, to look at ocean uh currents uh even more cheap than any observation is possible because we, we can reproduce, we can simulate or synthesize the ocean inside computers. And, and that's a lot of um, work that I do basically. So um, use it, using these really powerful computer models, we're able to um, do much more calculation of how the ocean is working and investigate more specifically how it's moving things around. So that's kind of a bit of a background and I want to now show you a bit more sort of uh, visual evidence of, of how the ocean or well, what happens out there and what happens next when the ocean gets its hands on something. So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, some amazing um, ocean scapes, which were not taken by me, by the way. I um, don't know whether anybody out there is a keen sailor, but there are some fairly interesting people that like to sail across the wider oceans and this is from the tropical pacific not far from the island of uh, fuji i think so shannon lens who was at that time sing by uh was was a, a rare witness to an occasional uh, phenomenon which is the under underwater eruption of a volcano and this is becoming uh more, more recognized i think as we get better at observing the ocean from space and there was a more dramatic um, re recent event near Tonga. So this happened I think in 2019 August and uh, that, that's the ocean but not as you would normally see it. It looks more like the surface of the moon except the sky is blue um, and, and that's a pumice which has come from below and it's been forced to the surface of the ocean in huge quantities to form this continuous kind of layer. The next is a similar picture, a very calm ocean. So this is probably in the doldrums where it's pretty calm anyway, but the effect of all that pumice is to sort of kind of uh, damp the waves down. So it's a very, very kind of uh, eerie sight. Um, these people sailed through this. I don't know how much damage that uh, um, but they had no choice because I think they were sort of stranded in it, so they had to keep going. Uh, consequently, uh, me and some colleagues wrote a scientific paper to describe and explain what would happen next to all this pumice, which we previously had um, had looked at on a different occasion. So these events are very interesting as kind of natural experiments of what the ocean does to drifting material. So pumice is a very kind of aerated uh, and, and light uh, rock. So if you look at a piece of pumice, of course, you know, you can use that uh, uh, to sort of um, scour away at something. Um, and th these are actual pieces of the pumice that were erupted um, near Tonga in 2019, lifted over towards Fiji, which is why I mentioned Fiji earlier. So my colleague, um, Martin Jutzler, who's now moved from Southampton to Tasmania, uh, provided that photograph. Um, interest from the point of view of the ocean current is that in this part of the world, there's quite interesting flows near the equator and uh, Everything that you um, that, that might gather at the surface of the ocean is rapidly reorganized. Uh, in this case, it's kind of organized into these 
streets. It's quite hard to see, actually. I'm going to use my point to see whether I can do that. So there are these long wheelie streets here and here. And this is looking down from space. This is quite a large scale uh, view, if you like, of, of the pumice rafts, we call them, as they start to move away from the site of the eruption. And that's on the 29th of August. So this is fully about 20 days after the eruption. Um, here's another picture of an island of the Fiji group. And um, here you can see more clearly this um, quite well organized bands of pumice. But the ocean is paradoxical because, on the one hand, it disorganizes um, the flow into this chaos, and then it seems to kind of reorganize it into structures like streaks and blobs and um, circular eddies. So, so I'm kind of sometimes contradicting myself because I say that the ocean is chaotic, but it also reorganizes things as well for all kinds of reasons that I won't go into. And what we were interested to do then was to ask the question, well, what, what would be typically going to happen to all that pumice that we could observe from space, but only in sort of small kind of fragmentary way. So we wanted to do something a bit more complete. So we use a, a way of uh, virtually putting pumice into um, a virtual ocean and then using the virtual ocean currents, asking it to move for a given period of time. So this, this is a set of results from our study. The top panels show that the color is getting, is getting older as you move away from the place where the eruption took place at Vavau, I think it's called. And so over a period of one month, some is drifted towards the Fiji island group. If you look over a longer time, so for up to two years, particularly in the bottom right picture, we're able to say that, um, as expected and known, the pumice from this particularly um, seismically active part of the tropical South Pacific is periodically erupted and will always tend to drift towards the west. And so you get this kind of um, arrival along the east coast of Australia in particular. It takes around maybe a year to a year and a half for the pumice to drift gradually towards Australia. And you might wonder why we care about this. And people actually have uh, established that each pumice stone is, is kind of a, a floating um, mini ecosystem because it provides um, a kind of uh, platform, if you like, or the life raft uh, for various organisms that like to attach to things. So um, these barnacles in particular, people that might remember the tragic loss of the MH370 might also know or um, might remember that bits of that crash plane turned up a long time afterwards. And the evidence that, it, that those pieces of flapper on had been out in the Indian Ocean for so long was the number of goose barnacles that had attached to the, um, to the floating debris. And the same thing happens naturally in the case of uh, volcanic pumice. So you can see there's a mollusk, uh, the bryosa. I'm not a biologist, so I struggle with some of this um, taxonomy. But the fact is that um, we, we think that there's a colonization of pumice stones, which then drift for maybe a thousand kilometers. And they, they're basically carrying um, various uh, organisms from one place to another. We think this is a way that the ocean connects life together across great distances in the tropics. So um, just out of interest then, how rare are these events? Well, um, people have looked into this and it looks like, um, Volcanic eruptions that lead to large pumice rafts that drift around for years afterwards are not that unusual. So even in recorded history, going back to the time of Krakatoa in 1883, there's been numerous volcanic eruptions that have led to significant uh, pumice rafting events. So this, this stuff has been drifting around forever. Uh, it's just part of the natural world and we probably didn't really notice it too much before. Um, we did a kind of thought experiment then, me and Eric. Um, we took all the known um, locations of submarine volcanoes, which is particularly around what's called the Ring of Fire in the Pacific, also in the Atlantic and other parts of the World Ocean. And we uh, required them to all erupt simultaneously. And then we followed all of the um, simulated pumice and 
coloured in according to how much it kind of started to um, accumulate. And you can see that um, there are certain sort of hot spots around the world where volcanic pumice is more likely to um, end up. And if you look at beaches around the world, you'll probably, sorry, particularly around these kind of hotspot areas, particularly around the tropics and maybe the subtropics, and you wander along, along a sandy beach, you'll probably come across bits of pumice without it even noticing that that's what's there. I've seen it myself on the uh, east coast of Australia before, actually remembering that probably came from a volcano further to the east. So it's kind of fascinating how what ends up on the beach, you know, beach combing, you know, typically people look for rare uh, seeds or possibly exotic shells, but there's also bits of pumice lying around. I'm going to spend a little time talking about like gas and seaweed, because that's the thing I know probably the most about right now, due to having spent three and a half years obsessed with it almost at times, it feels. Um, I didn't know much about it uh, until 20. 18, but um, this is a piece of uh, sargassum. Uh, it, it's a free-floating, what we call pelagic seaweed. It's not really a seaweed, it's, a, it's actually a brown algae. Seaweed is green algae. Brown algae is very uh, distinct from green algae. It looks like seaweed, so we sometimes call it that. Um, and it's a fascinating um, plant, but we call it that because it, it sustains itself on the open ocean for months or even years on end. And in recent times, it's become a major nuisance, which I will explain. And some of you may have heard about this in the news even. So that's just one small clump, but it comes in larger quantities. Um, I um, organized a little visit to the island of Antigua uh, and Barbuda, which is its sister island. Um, in the summer of 2018. The reason for that was that in the summer of 2017, in August and September of 2017, there were some very devastating hurricanes in the Caribbean. Um, it was really tragic for many communities. So we in Southampton wanted to travel to the Caribbean, see whether there were ways that we could work together with people in the region. And it turned out, um, visiting this island, uh, Antigua and Barbuda, that they were less worried about hurricanes, but more worried about sargassum. And this is a, a photograph I took uh, on the 6th of June, uh, 2018, on a very lonely coast of a little island called Barbuda, which I've mentioned is, it's a much smaller partner to Antigua, that is a fairly large, about the size of the Isle of Wight, uh, maybe 80,000 people live on Antigua, only a couple of thousand people live on Barbuda, but Barbuda was uh, largely destroyed by Hurricane Irma, the previous year. So while they're in the process of rebuilding, the wider region is more in concerned about sargassum. And the reason for that is that so much of it all of a sudden, uh, since the year 2011, it turns out, I'll go into the detail in a minute, um, become known as the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And when you get the chance um, to see it at sea, it looks a bit like this. Um, in some particular um, cases, it, it can sort of stretch as far as the eye can see in the middle of the ocean. Um, people probably have heard of the Sargasso Sea, which is further to the north in the subtropics. The Sargasso Sea is also home to sargassum, but not in quite the quantity that is now prevalent in the tropical ocean, so further to the south. So it's just a photo taken by colleagues of Eric, um, a research ship, um, somewhere in the tropics, far away from land. And you can see it's just this sort of endless green kind of um, plant. And I'll go into a tiny bit of detail as to why this is happening. So first of all, a map. So top left, it shows you the um, extent of the sargassum, which is stretching all the way. It actually goes further than is indicated here because we don't really see it very clearly over to the east due to cloud cover. So satellites can see sargassum from space, and that's how we know that it's at least here. It stretches all the way into the Gulf of Mexico, which historically, and um, has been known for years, is the kind of um, nursery ground for the sargassum, which flows with the ocean currents through the Straits of Florida and the Gulf Stream and end up in the Sargasso Sea. The Sargasso Sea is named for sargassum, which is an old Portuguese word for seaweed. 
But this new sargassum belt um, now extends, we know, all the way to Nigeria as well. So it's a really, really extensive phenomenon. It's one of the largest um, kind of, you know, biological phenomena on Earth, a bit akin to uh, um, the rainforests or the boreal uh, forests of, of Eurasia in Canada. And it's only started in 2011, so it's, it's about 12 years old uh, as phenomena go. And in the plots I show up here, this goes from actually 2006 to the end of 2022. I updated this data quite recently. And the bumps correspond to the amount of sargassum in the central Atlantic, where it's really sort of um, getting started and then spreading with the ocean current. So these pumps started in a small way in 2011 and 12, disappeared for a year and then came back and really built up by 2018. When I went on that trip to Antigua, things got really quite serious. And over the last three years, it's been getting worse. And I was there um, in, in Barbados, point to where that is, it's the, uh, the big, um, big yellow star right here. The big yellow stars correspond to three places where we've been working on this um, problem. Just mentioned they are Jamaica, Barbados, and Ghana. Um, and so this year, um, it's already really bad. And um, this is unusual because it doesn't normally get really bad until about April. So it started in January this year, which is quite unusual. Um, I won't really go into this detail, but there is a climate signature here and there are natural patterns of climate variability in the Atlantic which we which have always been with us but they are the triggers for what we think happened in 2011 so there's something called the North Atlantic Oscillation which dominates our weather so when we get storms that's because the North Atlantic Oscillation is positive as, as a pattern and when we get nice calm weather or cold weather in the winter it's because it's negative so this is a friend sort to our um, UK uh, sort of um, weather forecasters because it helps us to forecast the weather but it also has a tropical reach and something happened which I won't go into again too much uh, to say and not enough time but unusual conditions prevailed for about uh, two years and this seemed to push a seed stock of new sargassum into the tropics and then since then and these are just climate analyses that me and colleagues do if understood that there have been particularly favorable conditions. So it's kind of a perfect storm. Nature did something which is kind of natural, um, as in the climate patterns uh, varied as they did. But I think we've understood that uh, the extra warmth of the Atlantic, which has been particularly uh, evident in recent years, partly natural, but partly exacerbated by climate change, seems to favor the um, growth of this seaweed. Um, we, also, um, we also think that hurricanes might be important. And so it's not very clear, but we think that hurricanes are becoming more um, powerful. And we think they also somehow help this, uh, this growth. So um, the other thing that's changing in our world is the practice of turning things clearing forests, uh, adding too much fertilizer. And um, this is changing the nutrient balance of the oceans, in particular, the gardeners out there, nitrate and phosphate. Phosphate in particular fuels the growth of sargassum. We know that for the uh, last 30 or 40 years, it's been understood that phosphate drives sargassum growth. And we think that there's more phosphate coming out of the Amazon and the Orinoco rivers, also the, the Congo, which is just off my map here. So these are some data showing the pattern of the, the two important nutrients for the growth of sargassum and other phytoplankton in the oceans. Um, but there are all kinds of other ideas regarding the spread of the Sahara, which is making the tropical atmosphere dustier, the um, increasing number of wildfires in Africa. Also, we had a big volcanic eruption in 2021 in the Caribbean, which we've investigated as a possible source of nourishment which help helps this stuff to grow now this is what it looks like uh, i put this picture on the beach three weeks ago and uh, i want to emphasize that it comes in three sorts they're very different um they're always mixed up um so when you see sargassum on the beach you can sort of separate out 
this big chap called Sargassum Natans 8. Uh, this very fine fronded urchin called Sargassum Natans 1. And the piggy in the middle here is called Sargassum Flutens 3. And this is the problem one because although it comes in this combination of three, there's usually 80 to 90 percent this. And these are the, in the minority typically, although it's a bit more complicated. But we latest understanding is that this is the one which likes really warm water. It grows really fast, so it doubles its biomass every fortnight, which is quite staggering. Uh, although people say that's relatively slow, but I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's pretty quick. Uh, and therefore, it's the most prevalent of all the sargassum that we observe. I just mentioned that. I have been really involved in a big project in uh, looking to, to this. And um, although it's a bit of a dry slide, it, it sort of emphasizes a big project, which was called SARTRAC, uh, that was funded by the UK government and um, helps people in Jamaica and Ghana to raise their um, kind of activities in, in regard to understanding the sargassum that's affecting them. And this ran from the end of 2019 and it finishes September. So we're just coming towards the end of our project. It involved a lot of people, as science these days does, but I know all of these people really well um, after all these years. And um, we formed some great partnerships uh, with friends and colleagues uh, in these faraway places. And we, after the lockdown finished, we finally got to see each other uh, with a few trips. Um, I am conscious of our carbon footprint, but we have necessarily met in person in various places um, as project came to an end. In fact, last week, most of those people were in Southampton. And in fact, last Monday, we took a trip to Winchester to um, show many of our colleagues from uh, uh, Ghana and the Caribbean um, you know, how, how uh, ancient our local history is um, and our beautiful buildings and we had a, a lovely guided tour of Winchester Cathedral. Um, so I just emphasize that we were online doing all this work sort of over Zoom meetings. And it was really tricky, I think, trying to work in remote places without ever going anywhere. We managed to send equipment to do um, remote work in Barbados and Jamaica uh, during 2021. And finally, we began to go and see each other a little bit um, in Barbados and Ghana. Our Jamaica trip may still happen in July. Uh, and I think meeting in person is so much more kind of productive than seeing each other on a video screen, um, on a computer screen. So I was uh, very fortunate, I think, to go to Barbados um, just recently. So this is on the 10th of March. And this is at a place called Hastings, which is um, one of the main suburbs of Bridgetown. Barbados, again, I would say it's about the size of the Isle of Wight, and it is. Um, there's nearly um, 300,000 people live on Barbados, so it's a bit more crowded. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, it's relatively prosperous. And we met there with colleagues from Jamaica and Ghana as well. So we were trying to bring everyone together uh, for a, a, a symposium and some fieldwork. And at the time that we were there, the Sargassum began to arrive uh, because of a drop in the trade winds. And uh, this is a remarkable amount of sargassum for this part of the island. And this is a, a kind of beach resort over here. So a country like Barbados is heavily dependent on uh, tourism. And this, this is kind of a major issue for them. Um, I would just tell you a few words about what my part was, was to um, take uh, a go at, at trying to understand where the sargassum goes with the ocean currents, which is my theme, of course. So um, you can see it from satellite in this kind of broad sort of region from Central Atlantic, past Barbados, all the way to Jamaica. So my work has been to try and simulate how it moves from a start point over a period of three months, say. So what you see in this picture, everything starts from the red points, and there is over a million individual pieces of sargassum that I simulate moving. And the idea is to try and predict when it will arrive at Jamaica, which is the, the hooped little island there. And um, if we can forecast its arrival, we can better prepare for that. So this is a, a rather kind of technical picture, but it shows uh, my attempt to forecast the green curve. So the green curve is what actually happened in 2018 
Peter Baker. And when you um, hear the weather forecast, it's what we call an ensemble mean. So the weather forecast is never one single go. Met Office will always run the weather forecast model lots of times and take the average. And that's what you hear every night on the news. And that's what I've done as well, by the way. But rather than 100 people working on it, I did it on my own. So it's a little tricky working on this kind of uh, single handed, but I think it was a success and we were able to write this up and publish it. Um, and why do we care about Jamaica? Well, it has a kind of gas and ground truth that people on the island have worked really hard. Um, we've helped a little bit, but they've managed to map their coastline to show where sargassum is most serious and where it's most serious. It developed into these kind of huge kind of um, obstacles almost. So what should be a sandy beach is now receiving successive quantities of this weed, which builds up and it rots away and it has all kinds of negative consequences for the people. Uh, this picture is this little movie is to show you that when I just with an example um, animation here run my forward projections of just a few particles it's showing that depending where you start from my calculation can predict that everything will stick somewhere on the way and that happens to be the island of uh, St Lucia which is just to the uh, west of Barbados where we released a bunch of particles just north and south of the island to virtually see what would happen. We actually did this in reality with some GPS trackers, but we only had a few of those. And so we wanted to do some experiment to see where they would go. Now, the point of showing you this is to demonstrate that my predicted uh, particles can get stuck. And when they get stuck, we know where they might end up. And so this um, next slide, which I'm going the wrong way, is, is showing roughly how big is the amount of uh, bleaching sargassum around this Caribbean region? So depending where you are around the Caribbean, this problem is more or less serious. So the bigger the circle, the more at that particular location we expect sargassum to arrive at the coast. And we've done all kinds of work together, including this very painstaking two, three year survey of a beach to the east on the east coast of Barbados to understand just how variable it is. And it's very dependent on the currents and the winds, how it arrives, difficult to predict. We did the same thing for Africa, and in fact, I pressed both of those. And these are kind of much more uncertain experiments because on the eastern side of the Atlantic, it's very cloudy, so it's very difficult to uh, ground truth these predictions. But this is showing you, again, how the ocean currents gather up those original locations of um, sargassum, which is the red point, and it kind of breaks out into a current, the, uh, the Guinea current, which carries the sargassum along the coast of West Africa towards Nigeria. It's over there in the east. OK, um, we have, as a consequence of all this work, put together these kinds of cartoons to understand what's going on. I will not try to explain this, but there's a lot of influences on sargassum, including, I mentioned the rivers which deliver nutrient, um, the currents, and the winds, these are winds, these are currents. Um, and there's various phenomena going on in the Atlantic, which we need to um, really get to grips with to properly understand what's going on down there. What will happen in the future, though, is that the ocean is just going to get gradually warmer. And one of the things that we know about Sargassum is that it quite likes to be warm. And but if it gets too warm, it might start to die. It's probably a threshold temperature of around 29 or 30 centigrade beyond which sargassum will start to die. So the future is quite uncertain because on the one hand, it appears to quite like the warm, but on the other hand, it might get too warm. And we have climate models that we can look at far into the future. So up to the year 2050, this is the present time. So these yellow colors tell us that it's relatively warm. Uh, as we go into the future, as you can expect, we see kind of redder colors corresponding to greater warmth. And so sargassum potentially it's either going to die out or it's going to have to move a little bit further um, away from the equator and the tropics to survive. And that's what nature sometimes does. So I'm going to get kind of uh, close to wrapping up um, soon, I think. So not quite a lot more to show you, but I will kind of skip through some. But this is just an example of why ocean currents also matter for sea turtles who have a, a very fascinating natural history. We know that. Um, Sea turtles, um, they, they lay eggs on beaches, cover them up, and then a few 
weeks later, the little hatchlings emerge and head for the ocean. And what um, we've done here is to simulate what would happen to those drifting um, turtles over a period of a year. So the date counter here goes up to 365. And depending where in the world the open circle represents different population of sea turtles, they have a different um, destination and fate, all governed by the ocean currents. We've also worked quite a lot with, uh, in the past on icebergs, which in our part of the world, not so much our part of the world, but over to the west of the Atlantic, um, arrive from Greenland. Um, now, um, we have reasonably good idea of where those icebergs are, and I've um, used various data to explore the differences year to year in the number of icebergs uh, to the eastern Newfoundland, which is this, um, this big island here. Very beautiful place, um, and it's, I've, I've had the privilege to, to visit Newfoundland, um, but just um, offshore of Newfoundland in the spring, uh, a lot of icebergs are sometimes spotted. And it was in 1912, in fact, that um, one of those icebergs uh, extended far south and uh, met the Titanic, sadly, which is um, indicated by a little cross on my pictures here. So these are from 2009 to 2019. It shows how variable the number of icebergs are year to year in that part of the world. So it's still a danger to shipping, but people now are much better prepared for that. And again, that variability is affected by the condition of the ocean and, and the way the ocean currents sweep those icebergs far to the south, into, almost into subtropical waters. Actually, saw one through a telescope on the north coast of Newfoundland. Uh, I was rather pleased with that, but um, that was on a vacation a long time ago. Um, and in fact, we use ocean models to simulate these, both from, New, uh, from Greenland and from Antarctica, which is uh, about five times more productive in terms of icebergs and you frequently hear about very large tabular bergs that leave ice, uh, leave Antarctica. The final little bit is just to say rivers are important. I've highlighted the Amazon because the Amazon is, is almost like a river in the sea and this is probably also relates back to the importance for sargassum because it carries a lot of nutrient and it, it moves with the ocean currents um, over to the uh, Caribbean through the Gulf of Mexico and into the Gulf Stream. And well, all I'm going to say towards the end now is that we need to think about ocean currents, not in isolation, but collectively, we have to connect all those fragmentary bits together. Um, and these are the different sort of bits of drift that I've just indicated very schematically. And there's a, a white star and a yellow star here. And the reason I've indicated those is because rather oddly, I went on two work trips uh, back in 2018. One, one was to Antigua. Um, but then shortly afterwards, I went on a vacation to uh, Newfoundland, and they're both places called St. John's, which I found odd, um, the capital of Antigua and the capital city of the province of Newfoundland. Um, and what's interesting about them is that they're linked by the ocean circulation because uh, the waters that go past St. John's, Antigua, and Newfoundland are the same waters. So that was neat. Um, and they're kind of connected in this way by what we call the global. Then hairline circulation, which is a, a global circulation of warm, cold, uh, fresh and salty water. Um, and then I kind of put this last bit of the talk together by uh, suggesting that having been fortunate over 35 years to go to many different places on ships, occasionally work trips, even less um, uh, often on a vacation, I, I can take photos in places that are connected together by ocean currents. Um, so, you know, these two pictures over here are in the middle of the South Atlantic um, before and during a major storm. Um, this picture down here is actually near the Antarctic ice shelf. That's an enormous ice cliff there. Can't really see very clearly. Um, this is some sea ice in Antarctica. This is St. John's of Antigua, St. John's of Newfoundland, an iceberg which I saw from a transatlantic flight. Um, this is a, up in Scotland. This is uh, the Carib being, I think, and um, on we go. Um, actually, that's Antigua twice, I now realise. But um, in the top there, my old friend Sagassum. Um, that brings me to the end, thankfully, as I think I'm overrunning slightly. And um, I want to just leave you those three final thoughts that um, I told you bits, bits and pieces, uh, a fragmentary story of 
um, bits of research in different places at different times related to different bits of the ocean circulation, different ocean currents and drift. And although they might seem so separate and the, the topic, whether it be volcanic summits or turtle hatchlings, icebergs or sargassum, is all sort of specifically uh, one application. They're, they're all part of a, a greater ocean circulation. In fact, they, surface drift is part of what we call the upper branch of thermal line circulation. And I think then in a more general sense, the ocean currents, they, they link remote locations and communities. And ultimately, I think that I didn't have time to say much about this, but they drive and connect environmental change. And that obviously uh, in, includes our changing climate. So thank you for your patience and attention.